the opposite of what I do. Yeah. So it's like I fall in towards like that the one or lawyer. like the Lincoln lawyer and all those like law. I don't know. Yeah. Wait, once you get into it, it's hard to get out. Isn't that good, fellas? <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> All right, so chat, feel free to put in what your favorite movies are. So we got Pixar's Cars, Gone in 60 Seconds, and the Fast and Furious franchise. So Simon, where are we in our grid right now? Oh, I can't hear you on SPL, Simon. Uh, he's uh, yeah, I believe we're picking up the marker now as we're uh, getting close to end of dive time. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, so we'll let Simon concentrate <laughs> on picking up this mark so we can watch his amazing driving skill here. It's always fun to see Herc at work. That rhymes. I meant to do that. Maybe Dave can give us a view of Simon maneuvering too when we get a little closer in with Herc and stuff like that. It would be as fun last time. It's a really nice view on satellite feed two of Atlanta looking at Herc approaching this marker that we used uh, to make our grid while we're to make our models. You ready for drawer? I think so, yeah. Okay. Pretty steady there. Sam, try coming out. Right to that. So you can see they're just Sample opening the drawers in. from uh, satellite feed two. That'll be where they pick the marker and put it right back in. Thank you, Dave. It's an interesting view this time having that sample because we haven't really been taking much samples. So we collected some samples on this dive and now we're picking up this marker as well. So you get a view that we haven't really seen much on this expedition here. I'm watching Hercules do his more tactile movements here. Now you get to see there really is three cameras. Yeah, so on the triclops, it's, we're seeing three arms. It's kind of funny looking. Yeah, yeah. Who, who would have thought that the uh, simple fiducial recovery would turn into this like crazy like kaiju fight yeah. going down there? So we've just turned on uh, the Triclops view for you guys on, sat on feed three, that you can see the three Hercules arms reaching out. And then satellite feed one is showing what it actually is looking, and feed two is Atalanta watching Hercules. Yeah, um, scared the shrimp away. I feel like it's like that scene in the first Lord of the Rings where like the tentacle monster grabs Frodo and they're trying to fight him and get him back. It's really hard because depth perception on the camera is just, you know, incredibly difficult. And these guys do a tremendous job of being able to estimate that.
nice. You got it. Very nice job, Simon. Everyone give Simon a round of applause. All righty, folks, the, uh, the eagle has landed. <laughs> <laughs> now he's got That's the toughest the job. Bit. Put it in a back in this small little drawer. Yeah. So Jonathan's in the back here as you don't write down the samples until the drawer is closed because you never know when you might drop it. Oh, uh -oh. oh no! The I think we jinxed. Nice. We jinxed you. I just saw a jellyfish go by on the land of camera. Oh. That's a land of camera. I missed it. I've been focusing on the Hercules arm one. Rachel, would you be able to explain to our viewers how our satellite works? What kind of how we get our internet imaging, all this in such good quality? We're able to live stream videos. I can't even get my phone to work and do a video calls from my house. How are we able to do it out in the middle of the ocean? All right, that is an excellent question. And um, so this is actually, this is a really interesting year for us because this is the first year that Starlink Maritime has been available. So in the past, we would only have one answer to that question, but uh, this year we get to have a part A and a part B. Um, so the biggest challenge that you face trying to get uh, internet working out at sea is that normally, so you know, we have to do it wirelessly. Um, and there's no way that it's, you know, there's no way we're going to be able to tow a cable behind us. So anything that we do to get internet wirelessly is, you know, is really going to be the only option. Um, and the, when you're looking at wireless systems, the, so the, the, you know, the frequencies of that we're using for high speed wireless data transfer, uh, they travel in a line of sight fashion. So the, the issue we run into is now, at this point, we're about 100 miles um, off the coast of Hawaii. So the issue you run into trying to build wireless, you know, links uh, over long distances is that if you're going like straight along the Earth's surface, uh, the Earth is actually going to get into, it's going to get in the way. Uh, so one of the most, you know, practical uh, examples of how like the Earth is like actually round is you know you can't see an infinite distance you can only see into where the earth gets in your way so sorry for any flat earthers that are listening to this but yeah the earth is round we we got to just we got to <laughs> burst that you know burst that bubble really quickly um so because because the earth is round and we you know we can't just have a straight shot going you know level um off the off the side of the ship um, and because our radio waves that we're working with are only travel in a line of sight fashion, the only way that we can actually close the link is by going up. And so the we have two uh, we have two uh, satellite systems on board. We have our traditional VSAT, and we have Starlink, which is a new system. Uh, and basically, at a 
from a very physical perspective, what these systems are doing is, oh, that's cool. We have the van camera up. Which which one am I looking at? We're looking. Oh. oh yeah. Okay. Which which? Yeah. Where are we? I think it's behind us. Wait, somewhere. Is it is it behind us? Over here. Yeah. Oh wait, sweet. It's over okay. Here, here right we here. go. All right. Yo, what's up? What's up, Nautilus <laughs> Live? Hello, world. Uh, so basically, the whole the satellite itself is fundamentally a mirror. You know, we we need to have line of sight. So, so if what you it's guys look at satellite three. Rachel's going to do hand motions to show you this. Well, it's <laughs> yeah. pretty dark there, Rachel. Uh, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's see if we can do something better. Oh man, I wish I, I wish I had a telestrator. I could draw this on. What to do? <laughs> Um, so basically what's going to happen is, so here... Okay, turn around towards the camera that's between the monitors. I think this one. Uh, this one. Yeah, which one? Turn the one right in front of you. Oh, oh sweet. Here we, the here we go. There you yeah. go. Hi there. Okay. <laughs> and okay. All right. Oh, cool. This here we go. All right. All right. So, if you're world, if you're watching, look so at feed three to see Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So we're on Nautilus here. And we've got this, uh, you know... This <laughs> <laughs> now that oh, we, we have totally these broke 3D those. models. We definitely just straight up broke this 3D printed model. <laughs> That's all right. It happens at sea. Uh, so we've got our, our, you know, our, our hub that gives us internet back on shore, and we've got our ship that's at sea. And because we have the Earth's globe uh, bulging you know, in the way, what we're going to do is we're going to use a satellite is basically just a mirror we can bounce our signal off of. So we're going to take this long path up, and in the past, from the very early days of you know, long-distance communication, so the original technology for satellites was in geosynchronous orbit. And how that worked is you had one point that was very far up in space, such that it maintained its, its relative okay, position. Um, its okay. position relative to the Earth's. So that's what, that's what geosynchronous means. As the Earth turns, the satellites in the same spot, so they're always facing each other. So what we okay, would do closing box. is we had our satellite antenna on Nautilus would shoot our signal up to this up to the bird in Geo, and then that would bounce back down, and that would give us a line of sight path from Nautilus at sea to an Earth station back on land. And you know the the because it was a geosynchronous orbit yeah, satellite or bird. Um, the advantage there was that it was always at the same mm -hmm. point, but the disadvantage is the path was very long, yep. and so we had a lot of uh, we had okay. a lot of latency that came from that. Right, and so we that also we needed a very powerful transmitter, and it also meant that the just the signal it's, or the user experience was limited, because bandwidth on these birds was really expensive. So remember, so geosynchronous means that there's one spot and it's always in the same position relative to Earth. And the nice thing about that is it's really expensive to launch, but it's going to stay in the same place. So, what's um, the so that now this year I said that the new technology we have available, is Starlink Maritime, and you know geosynchronous is you've got one very consistent target, one satellite. It's expensive to launch, but you know once it's there, a lot of people can use it. Um, the so Starlink works fundamentally differently. Because instead of having one bird really high above the Earth, now you have thousands that are a very short distance from the Earth. And the economics of it is it's, you know, it's each individual satellite is a lower orbit, so it's, it's a bit cheaper to put in. But the problem is you have to have hundreds and thousands because they're not staying at a consistent spot. They're constantly moving. Okay. Uh, every four minutes, our ship actually has to talk to a new Starlink satellite because the other one's already gone over the horizon. Oh. And you know the, the way SpaceX was able to make this work is that before they built Starlink, they built the um, like 1979 Peterbilt Expressway up into up into Leo because they were they got the economics of satellite launches really down and really tight that allowed them to build this massive constellation of hundreds of thousands of satellites in an economical fashion and turn it into a commercial product that we are using right now. Great description. Thank you so much, Rachel. That made so much sense. And I better Thanks. understand Starlink now, too. Mm -hmm. I, it's one of those Taking things you hear about, off. but I didn't actually understand how it worked. Yeah. 
So where we're at is uh, Simon successfully picked up the uh, marker, put it in the Let side Let me know when bins, he does it ready. And he's now preparing to come off the bottom and gonna winch up. Sorry, Rachel, you're off the, the feed now. <laughs> Rachel is playing it's with our 3D. Play with the it's model. still fun yeah. to play with the 3D model. Yes. I was I was getting ready to do some some X's and O's. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just a learning style. Many people have the tactile learning yeah. style. So, you know, you have to, it's not just uh, verbal anymore. Yeah. Um, Jason wants us to send him a 3D printed model, but Jason, you yeah, right can access this in and or... print yourself one. But if you don't have a 3D not. printer yourself, so many uh, many libraries okay. so uh, now have, up, so? uh, at least in my area, all the libraries have a 3D printer. So you can go in and take essentially a 3D model okay. and they will print it for you. Very cool. So if you don't have one yourself, there's still places that will do it for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a question in the chat asking if I mean, we, we will be exploring the Lohiki Seamount. For TJ on the back, right? And I believe that is the plan for in a couple Let's days. Come on. <laughs> I think so. I think uh, it's on the plan for next week. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> it's obviously up for, <laughs> up for weather. Yep, always. That's the tentative plan, but you never know right. until we're actually on yeah. the dive. Coming yeah. up to three zero meters a minute. Cool. And um, actually, folks, as we uh, begin right. the recovery phase three of this dive, I am actually going to have to head out. I will be uh, assisting our duck team with recovery. So Thank with you. all of our photos taken and uh, successfully downloaded, I uh, keep it keep Thank it real. You. We will wave to you as you're on the back deck? Yes. Absolutely. Or in the so. hangar? <laughs> Indeed, you, uh, as a matter of fact, you uh, if you stay tuned in about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, you get to still be me out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. Always All a right. pleasure. Thank you. Let's do back row fist bumps. Thanks. Yeah. That was Thanks. wonderful. All right, go team. Yeah. <laughs> so it has been a great dive. Yeah, would you like to give us a little dive recap? Sure. So essentially what happened today, uh, we, we dove and came down. And then the first thing we did was take an orbit survey. So we went to waypoint actually three, which was midway along this seamount, and then descended down all the way to, well, not all the way to the bottom, because this, this seamount goes very deep. But we descended down to essentially about uh, 1,600 meters, uh, roughly around there, um, and got a sonar scan. So we essentially had a 110 meter wide sonar scan that we went down and they process it almost immediately thanks to the um, great technical people on the boat, on the ship here. And then we use that to drive up optically and almost at the very beginning saw the manganese nodules. We took a sample just so that we can date it and understand exactly what the compositions are and really understand the environment that, the, you know, that is down there. Uh, from there, we continue to work our way up and continue to see, as Dr. Ballard described, that you know, flowing river of sediment that's uh, rolling down the hill um, very slowly, right, over millions of years. And as those uh, you know, small pebbles roll down, they yeah, get so more they non they slow they down for me. absorb more manganese and yeah, uh, grow in size. Uh, we found a number of different coral species uh, as we continued up. And then they saw a shark, I believe. Hmm? Um, any other major things, yeah. Zach, that they saw? Do you remember? No, I think that's about it. Yeah. Had, a, had a good patch of the sponges here and there, a little bit. Um, but I think this is yeah, a, th this is the greatest coral diversity that we've seen from the deep, uh, you know, going up. That's a good. Um, made it all the, the way to the top of a, you know, top of sort of a small little ridge, 
Um, went back down in the saddle and saw more, you know, essentially more of the same that we, we've seen before. And then essentially turned and went to the top of this mountain here, um, of the sea mount where we got to the very peak. We saw it was very rugged and rigid and uh, started the survey and essentially ran out of dive time. And now we are extending up. But we took two samples along the way. We so did. we'll be able to kind of determine what is this age. But as uh, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Ballard stated, it's 32 million years old is what we think. I'm so. excited to see the process of sampling those rocks and what we do for the preparations with that. So plan on going in and helping in the there wet lab go. and see them. And I'm sure them. most of it's going to have to you know, be shipped back you know, to a lab on this, in the States or yeah. you know, in Hawaii where they have mass spectrometer so we can see what the competition, uh, compositional makeup of the modules are. All right, so for those of you listening at home, we have started our ascent. You can see the blue water, but I still wouldn't give up on that. You never know what can swim on by even in the blue water. Um, so you feel free also to put some questions in the chat and we'll answer as many as we can until we get to about 50 meters. And then at that point we have to stop responding because we uh, begin the delicate process of recovering our ROVs. So we wanna let our pilots and our operations staff be able to concentrate on that. So our current depth right now is 934 meters and Hercules water temperature is 4.49 degrees Celsius and rising. What was your favorite part of the dive today? Favorite part of the dive? Yes. I liked, I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Ballard's explanations on everything. It was quite a treat to be able to sit in the control van and have his experience and expertise and sharing that with all of us out here. I would have to agree with that. Yeah. You always learn something new. You um, definitely do. I, mean, I, I was just, I was just amazed that, you know, what I didn't realize is, you know, after 32 million years, where did this thing start? And it was like, Dr. Mara was saying Central America. Yeah. And after 32 million years, it's made it halfway across the Pacific. So as that tectonic plate is shifting, it's shifting all the way towards, you know, the Ring of Fire in Japan and subsiding underneath. So slowly but slowly, that plate is, you know, essentially eroding away and going under, you know, essentially underneath, going yeah. underneath and then melting. So we're losing, you know, this is maybe some of the oldest earth crust around. Kind of crazy to think about it when you put it in that perspective, huh? Yeah, it's plate tectonics. Oh, just saw a shrimp go by. If we're doing a shrimp count, oh, we I never started it. <laughs> we didn't. Yeah, we have we have epically failed on the shrimp count. I think I, we should. I know that was a request, but it's just so hard. It is. So many cool things to look at. So much, and then. It's like shrimp is a good number because there's not a crazy amount of them. Like we couldn't do a crinoid count, for example, yes. because we just see too many of them. But well, we can do a crinoid jumping count. A crinoid jump. We, uh, we, <laughs> we have one. We have one. I got that one. Or have to do across multiple dives. Yes. I don't know. Maybe I can mentally keep up with our moose goose fish count. So. We did not see a goose fish. We did not. This is oh. our first dive that we did not see a goose fish. I kind of miss it now. I'm hoping we have the 3D model of the goose fish. Oh, yes. And then 3D. maybe, we have to put maybe on that someone 3D can make a 3D print. model of the moose yeah. fish. That would be pretty cool. That would be an inter. It would be, a very, would be the prickly, a very prickly model with all its, yeah. Zach, can you do that for us? Do what? Take the goosefish and put uh, antlers on it. Oh, if anybody <laughs> can, Quinn can. Oh. <laughs> he's, the, he's the printer yeah. guy. <laughs> All right, Quinn, if you're listening, you have to make a moosefish for us. That'll be our Halloween mascot. Our Halloween mascot. For trick or treat. For the expedition. I, I highly approve of this mission. And the chat is saying it's always a treat when we get to have the legend of Dr. Ballad giving his expertise. And I highly agree with that. It is. Is anybody out there going as a sea creature for Halloween? Ooh, any, yeah, what is, chat, what is your Halloween costume ideas? 
I'm going to keep mine a secret until the day of Halloween. Ooh. Yeah. But I'll give a hint and see if anyone can guess. It is a Netflix movie title. Netflix movie title. Blackbird? Nope, it's not Blackbird. No. I only get one guess. <laughs> I'll try again. Uh, one one guess per <laughs> one, one guess, guess per, per dive. One guess per dive. We got two more left. But tune in on Halloween so you just, mm -hmm. they can see what your costume is. Yeah. Are you wearing it in the control? I'll wear it in the control van. All right. I'm going to wear it for ship to shore interactions as well. Very nice. Yeah. And if any of you in here did not bring a Halloween costume, apparently the ship does have a supply of them. So they do. So don't think you're off the hook. Oh. Yeah. I don't know where we go trick or treating all the way out here. Oh, I I, I know of a I've SCF got that who too. who brought candy. Yeah. I have candy. I, I'm pretty sure yeah. there's some candy aboard. I know. I know where the costumes are yeah. too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I am in need of costumes. Okay. Well, we got. Well we, then. We got you covered. Will you, I, I will see you later. Will you agree uh, to wear the costume of my choice? <laughs> oh, I like this. Uh, I, uh, I don't need a costume that bad. No, no. <laughs> I believe I heard that Ben was volunteering for the costume. Yeah, if, if you didn't bring a costume, oh, you choice. are at the mercy I of I will make Dave's a costume. costume. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We'll see. I have a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a cop out. <laughs> all that means is Friday at Hawaii. <laughs> Hello. Everything's captured on everything's captured on social media on this ship. I can't walk around and. <laughs> that's the fun of it. Just just embrace it. I mean, it, you get the excuse that it is Halloween, so why not? Oh, I see the recovery teams assembling. Do we have quite a bit of time? We Still have 40 current, minutes. Our current depth is 791 meters, and it is 5 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so what is the estimate for how much time it will take for us to reach the surface? It was about one hour from the time we started, so I would anticipate around, you know, 8, 10. We can give the audience another math question. They said they're saying at three meters. What was it? Three meters per second. Three percent rate. No. I can't hear. Did you hear? Twenty-two uh, meters per minute is. Twenty-two, sorry, per, 20, minute. 20, 22 meters per minute. Twenty-two per minute. Twenty-two meters per minute, and our current depth is seven hundred seventy-six meters. So shout out to whoever can do the math first on. How long it will take us to reach the surface? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody with the answer can already answer. I will also give you <laughs> extra credit points. <laughs> it's actually amazing what I've done. I've offered students like you can pick between um, candy or extra credit points, and a lot of times they'll pick the extra credit points even if they that, yeah. already have an A they'll still pick the extra credit points. And I'm all right with that, it's cheaper for me. <laughs> there you go. Well, what candy? <laughs> What's Is it Skittles? It's, um, I usually go to Costco and get a one of those like big. Do you get the Hershey's bag? No, big. I don't do the Hershey oh. bags because my classroom does not have air conditioning oh. and chocolate melts. <laughs> it does melt. All right, so we have 35 minutes, so 8.06 p.m. That should be correct. All right, good job. Uh, your sender says anonymous, so good job anonymous who wrote that in. <laughs> but remember, we also hold at 50 meters, and so I put, we do I hold put five at minutes in for. Yeah, we do hold at 50 meters, and so there's extra time on there, but based off the math. Based on the math, correct. that's correct. That's pretty quick work, too. Mm -hmm. So you were down in the data lab, Zach. How long did it take to print this? Th how long did it take to print it, the uh, basalt? 
formation. The basalt was, I think it was two and a half hours. Two and a half hours, wow. I think that's what it came out to. Because it did like a time-lapse feature of it where it was adding layers. It was interesting to watch. The first one he made was a little bit smaller, and that one took like an hour and a half. I think that one was a little over, yeah, two, Wait, two and a so half. Wait, so we have two models of basalt on this yeah, ship? The other yeah. one was his uh, rough draft. Yes. Oh. Yeah. You know, you make, you know, you always practice I, first, right? It's true. Yeah. And it was yellow. This one looks looks much better with blue. Blue. The yellow looked like a block of cheese. So everybody kept asking for the Ooh, cheese. Ooh, basalt <laughs> cheese. That's the new thing. But it's it's impressive, the little details, like, you can get in that thing. The, the, yeah, they were both really good. And then the boat, yeah, he, he started that right when I came up here for my shift, so must have taken that about a, two hours or so as well. How expensive, does anyone know how expensive it is for this plastic? I don't know the plastic. The printers range in price, I know. Yeah. You can get them from a couple hundred up to a couple thousand, depending on what you're, what and you're do doing. And do you know that you can 3D print metal? Yep. I did not know you could 3D print metal. Yes. The last uh, rocket that was launched, I believe, was 3D printed a lot of the components. Really? Yeah. It, they even have so 3D printed wood material now, too. They do. Interesting. I have, um, my nephew made me some pickup surrounds for one of my guitars out of a 3D printed like wood thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so they, you, you can you can do it in like a resin bath where they have a laser that comes down and essentially just creates it, you know, in this resin bath. And then you have the, you know, these are plastic, um, essentially wires that essentially get fed in and then mounted. And then like some of the, um, some of the metal stuff is uh, metal particles where the laser comes and then it heats it up and essentially just melts it right to the surface as yeah. they blow the particles past. So that's how you do metal, comp you know, metal composition and build up 3D parts. You can do titanium, aluminum, they almost any metal. Yeah, they do it with jewelry a lot too. Oh. Yeah. Well, Veronica was Karen. the one that did that math. So good job, Veronica. You get the extra credit points for tonight and the shout out. Good job. So yeah, chat, feel free to check, type in any questions that you have for us out here. We are at your mercy for the next half an hour. Mm. We're still Sorry. watching. We're still watching the cameras. See what's tired, going yeah. on. Yeah, oh, I'm crossing my fingers still for those manta rays to come on out. Who mm -hmm. we're a long ways. Yes, we maybe the pelagic mantas though. Yeah, they're maybe bigger. A couple of them. Yeah, they're they're pretty rare though. But yeah, we got a lot of marine mammals around this island that travel long distances too. So you never know. Like you said, maybe the humpbacks will make an early appearance. Maybe. Um, they want to know if your costume, if you're sure, you could be a homicidal maniac or a Star Trek away party. <laughs> oh, I like the Star Trek away party. Yeah, that could be pretty easy to make. I went to Star Trek one year. Yeah. I've never... Star Trek. <laughs> I've never seen it. But for Star Trek, you have, to ask, you have to ask, is it the old with Captain Kirk or no. the new with Captain Picard, Next Generation, or the original? The chat is saying there's 3D printed cement homes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they started good. doing homes. Yeah. They're very nice. They're very quick to do. Yeah. I have a, I have a friend in um, Kona who's, who's trying how, to get that going. How does that, like... How, what, what's the size of the printer? Like, are they printing blocks? Or they print how are they? I don't know. Just actually, I honestly don't know. So it all? actually, so it's, it's an arm that goes down, just like you would see, uh, and it has essentially a flow of cement, and they essentially build it up layer by layer. So they build, like, one small layer that's, let's say, say it's five inches wide and maybe three inches tall, and they go and they print the first layer, and you know it's you know it's blocky or it can be round because they can do they can, they can essentially do domes right uh, so you print the first layer and as that dries then they go over and they print the next layer on top of it so it's almost like quick drying cement and they can just continue to run over it and you either create like square that builds straight up or you can create domes that go in you can actually do houses that go out crazy yes Add manufacturing. I it's the way of the future. Heard, yeah, never even heard of 3D printed cement. Can you imagine if you don't have to, like, you know, right now you go and try to buy parts is, at is the that store? Cheap? Does it make it cheaper then to build the home if you 3D print it or more expensive? I don't know the answer to that question because I think it depends on how expensive the machine is. I would love and, some cheaper you know. ways to make some homes in Hawaii so that maybe I could eventually afford to live in one and buy one. <laughs> 
But wouldn't it be nice if you could just go to the auto parts store and say, I need a replacement part and press a button and it prints it out for you and off you go? Yeah, especially when you have like older cars and then yeah. they stop making them and then those parts are very insanely expensive to get or hard to get. My family has an old Model A Ford and those parts are really hard to get. So that would be nice to 3D print them. My dad has a Mustang. I always forget the year though, but an old classic Mustang. Hmm. What year is your dad's classic Mustang? Oh, I always forget. I don't know if my mom's listening. Mom, if you're listening, text me what year the Mustang is. She was listening when I... When oh, I, yeah, I remember. Oh, you got yeah. corrected. I got, I got you, in trouble last time. She did try to speak time. your Spanish. Yeah, she yelled at me when I said my parents didn't teach me a foreign <laughs> I, language. I'm, I'm trying to learn Spanish. Yeah, and so then apparently... Teach me. So, watch, now that I want her to listen, she's probably huh. not listening to me. <laughs> I think it's like a 58 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But... The first year that they came out with it, it was 64 and a half. Okay, so then it's a... <laughs> it's a it's close. It's she got the prototype prototype. 60, then it's a... Sorry, 68. <laughs> I used to... 68. Okay, I used to have a 68 Mustang as well, so... <laughs> that was my second car. I knew I was going to say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I got a text and I thought it was my mom, but no, it was our our ship's WhatsApp group instead. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, it was actually you. <laughs> Mike, are you a car person? Uh, partially, yeah. Partially, what's your favorite type uh, of car? Type of car? Type of car. Ooh. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the old Chevy five windows back in the like 50s era, the Chevy pickups. Okay, yeah. Chevy's, I don't know. I've been to the, um, the Corvette Museum. That was kind of fun mm. to see all the different old Corvettes. That made me like Corvettes for a while. Someone in the chat wrote 66, but there's no name to it. So I don't know if that's my mom. Typing in 66 into the chat. So, Mom, if that was 66, put 66, Mom. If it's random person saying 66, <laughs> that's really weird if you know what kind of car model my mom, my parents have. <laughs> now someone's just going to write randomly 66, Mom. <laughs> oh, she is texting me. Oh, she was the one listening. So it was a 66 Mustang. Thanks for listening to me, Mom. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good mom. Yeah. Where yeah. is your mom? She's in California right now. What part of California? Uh, Clarksburg, California. Uh, it's located outside Sacramento. So my parents actually bought the house next door to my grandparents. So she's busy remodeling it, but my parents actually live in Arizona. So oh, okay. for the moment. I know it's, about remodeling. We, it's yeah. late there. So mom, apparently you can 3D print the house if you want. <laughs> there you go. We inherited a house a couple of years ago from my, uh, my wife's parents and uh, we've been remodeling. What have you, uh, what's the hardest part of remodeling, you think? Making enough money. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do a lot of the work ourselves. Uh, we've done two uh, bathrooms, full gut jobs, uh, all the way down to the studs. And uh, in the first one, we actually moved the wall to make it bigger, uh, and then rebuilt everything back from scratch. I have a, a friend across the street who's a contractor, so we're his part-time project, and uh, he does if carpentry for me because I'm a terrible carpenter, <laughs> but I do plumbing and electric. Where's your house located? Florence, Oregon. Florence, Oregon. It's right in the middle of the Oregon coast. 
Oregon is beautiful, due, the Oregon coast. Due west of Eugene, right in the yeah. middle of the coast, right in the middle of the sand dunes, sea land caves, all that kind of stuff. Lovely area. Yeah, it's great. When we get done here in another uh, week and a half, and I go home, then I hopefully finish up the other bathroom. I have a giant soaking tub to install. Mm. That'll pretty much put the finishing And then while you're that. taking a bath in your giant tub, you can have your 3D printed Nautilus. I need a 3D printed right Nautilus. Right there I with do. you. Uh, yeah. um, I don't yeah. know if it floats. It's my uh, uh, test that. We'll have to experiment. Yes. And I thought they said this was hollow, right? to make it cheaper, so it should float. Might float upside down. I don't know if the, the ship would stay upright, but it'll it'll float, probably fall to the side. We have to put some ballast in it. Yeah. I guess Quinn's got a full-time work for the rest of the trip. Oh, did the satellite break off? It did. We're, we're, I'm sure there's super glue somewhere. I think we can manage to find oh super yeah. glue on the boat. It was a very nice job on that. So back here. Does it? Does it? All right, so our current depth is 459 meters, and we are at 7 degrees Celsius. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we started talking about cars. What kind of cars does everyone drive when you're not on a boat where you can't drive? Dan, oh. what kind of car do you have? I have a Toyota Highlander. So Those it's like nice. an SUV, but yeah. it's also like, you know, a minivan. That's what I would like a Toyota Highlander. I can't afford a Toyota Highlander. So I have a Honda Civic. I have an old one. Or I have a Honda CRV. I think Hondas are very dependable and affordable. I like yeah. my Honda. Zach, what kind of car do you have? I have a uh, Dodge truck. Dodge truck. Yeah, oh. big four by four truck. So you need that for all the fish you get? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, for, for fishing and diving and off-roading. Hawaii has that you pay your car registration based on the weight. Yeah. Oh. So, Gets yeah. me every year. Uh, yeah. I just paid it actually before I came here. Yeah. Oh, it's. I had a car. I had a Toyota RAV4, and I just paid the registration for it. And, like, a week or two later, the engine seized up and the car was useless. And... You don't get a refund on that. It hurt. Yeah. Yep. Once you get a good car out here, it's hard to give it up. Yeah. Simon, what kind of car do you have up there? Uh, I currently have three cars. Three so cars. I have a, a supercharged V8 Range Rover Sport, which is my main kind of car. That's um, your main kind of car? <laughs> yeah. And then I have uh, an Abarth 500, which is uh, like a Fiat 500. But, okay. Um, Turbocharged, 1.4 liter, 185 horsepower, <laughs> little pocket rockets, and I have a Subaru WRX wagon, a Japanese import, 2000. <laughs> yeah. So. Remind me to not challenge Simon to a race. <laughs> 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 Mike, how about you? Uh, I got a, uh, I got a 4x4 four four taco. Yeah. So did Tacoma. Tacoma. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was like, Taco, what? I got you. <laughs> I don't know what that noise was. And Dave, how about you? Uh, let's see. What is it? I don't know. Oh, a Hyundai. A Hyundai Santa Fe. It's my wife's car. I don't know. It's a, it's a Hyundai Santa Fe, so a mid-size SUV. But it was uh, all tricked out with everything. It's turbocharged, so that it gets very good gas mileage. It's kind of fun yeah. to drive. Gas, but gas I, mileage is the last thing I worry about. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But I had to. I had to trade in my uh, my Volkswagen GTI uh, yeah. in order to uh, get that, and uh, I, re I regret Top doing that. Top Gear did an experiment years ago, and they 
drove a Toyota Prius around their track and asked a BMW M3 just to keep up with it. Yeah. And the BMW M3 <laughs> got better gas mileage than the Prius. <laughs> yeah. It's how yeah. heavy your right foot is, not uh, right. Mm. heavy. Right. <laughs> no, the, the, uh, the GTI was great. Drive it around town, it's a Golf, right? Yep. Yeah. Drive safe. it around town, it gets great gas mileage and that kind of stuff. And then you mash down on the lot pedal and, and you know, and it's got a little, it's got a gauge, right? It says you're getting, you're getting 22 miles to the gallon. And then you step on the gas and it says you're getting 10 miles to the gallon, <laughs> 7 <laughs> miles to the gallon, 3 miles to the gallon. Yeah. But it was very fun to drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Johan, what kind of ca car do you have? Oh, I think Johan's doing navigation. <laughs> Simon, I have a comment for you in the chat. Yes. My 50-year-old Canadian Datsun 24 or 240Z might give you a run for your money. Uh, I love the 240Z. I love the 240Z as well. Uh, I had a, a 350Z three, three uh, a while ago. Nice. Um, yeah, the 240, I love that car. Yeah. So I amazing. Wish the new 400 looks vaguely similar to the 240, which is... Is that right? Yeah, it's, yeah. I like it. Well, 240Z came out when I was in high school, and everybody wanted one, and, you know, wasn't... Yeah. Uh, the Range Rover's pretty quick. The Abarth will probably have it around the corners. Yeah. Definitely. That's yeah. four <laughs> square to the floor. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. That sounds like fun. Sticks to the road like a terrified toddler to your leg. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> that sounds like a Top Gear line. <laughs> that, that is. <laughs> So someone in the chat is asking if we use bike or public transportation at all. Not where I live. Really? Don't really have it. I, don't know. I mean, you kind of <laughs> got it, but skateboard. I, I metro <laughs> and I bike. Yeah. Depending on where I'm going. Yeah. When I lived in Seattle, uh, I lived in the north end of Seattle in an urban village called Northgate, and I worked on the campus of the University of Washington. I had a subsidized bus pass by the university, uh, and so my wife and I both worked for the university, and we both rode public transportation, but. 90% of the time, yeah. uh, and it was great. And in your, if you're in an urban place that has uh, good public trans with you know bus lines and trains and, and that kind of stuff like Seattle does now, yeah, uh, it's great. But I've used the Seattle public transportation when I get when I go in there, and I do like yeah. I can get around pretty well with it. Honolulu is just not bad. Uh, if you're going short distance, like if you're staying within Waikiki, Honolulu, you can take the bus, no problem. They have a lot yeah. of places where you can also rent a bike and kind of, and that's kind of nice that you, mm -hmm. you know, you take it, drop it off and things like that. Yeah. But if you're going outside the Honolulu area, it's a little difficult. We did right. just start getting the tram, but it's very few stops. I live have all the way on the North Shore. I was going to say, have you ridden the, the new monorail? I have not ridden the new monorail. It's Don't even get me started oh, on the new I monorail. Like, it, this is, does it go to the airport? This is a sensitive topic it, here. It, oh, yeah, it's a super sensitive topic. Yeah, we could, I could get into Let's talk about long. the weather. Where does the monorail go? <laughs> no, no. It goes, from, it goes from nowhere to nowhere. Okay. Doesn't it go to the airport? I mean, I thought I saw No, tracks. it hasn't. It has nope. not made it to the airport yet. yet. But they're, no. they're building it, right? There's they're, tracks. They've been building it. Yeah. It broke ground <laughs> in what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it is 14 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I live on the North Shore, so my drive from work to home is about an hour. It is possible by bus but it would probably take over two hours by bus for me to do that. And I cannot spend four hours a day of my life on a bus. So, yeah. All right, our depth now is 314 meters and we are at 9.61 degrees Celsius, so have not hit the double digits yet in temperature. Why is it colder below? Why is it colder below? Great question. Um, I think a, part of it is you have the warming of the heat from the sun at the surface. And then, yeah, I know it doesn't get any colder 
than two degrees Celsius because of specific heat capacity. So water can hold heat. So I, it's probably a combination of that. I think I just tested my students on this when you're totally making me blink on why but it, yeah it starts to it normalizes out at a certain point at a depth it kind of starts to decrease less and less but yeah if anyone arctic upwelling someone said not really upwelling is more nutrients based and bringing up that nutrients zach what about you what do you think why is it getting colder as we go deeper in the ocean? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the currents. I know density is weird when you get down there with different salts and temperatures. One takes over the other. The uh, um, colder water is also denser, so then that sink yeah. and coming in the sea, you get the yeah the the sub bottom mm -hmm. currents are from the Arctic and Antarctic as that cold water sinks yeah. and travels along the bottom. I've seen it like one, one and a half degrees, uh, even down in Brazil and the. Um, sea temperatures down there yeah so that's part of our global conveyor belt yeah. so our um, once you get up into those Arctic waters that cold polar water causes the um, this vertical current to push that cold water down into the deep and our deep currents are really density driven whereas our surface currents are more wind driven so our Currents are really affected a lot by the temperature and salinity in them. But the major, the major reason is cold, salty water is denser, so it will yeah, naturally it, 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 sink to the bottom. Um, which is a fun experiment you can do at home. So if you take a beaker cup and you put, say, like 10 grams, 20 grams of salt, and it's cold, ice cold water, and then you take hot, fresh water, and then put some food coloring into them, say like red and blue, and then put first put the cold water in, and then very, very slowly put the hot water, the hot fresh water in over the top. I recommend to put over a spoon just to make it so that the water is not hitting with too much force and accidentally mixes everything up. But you can then see, and they'll stay layered, they'll stay separate. And you can even leave it out for a few days and even with the temperature's gone and it's the same room temperature because you have that salt in the fresh water, you'll have these columns and it's pretty cool. So you can simulate making the ocean by playing around with different salinities, water temperatures. I challenge you to try it. See if you can make three layers, do three different combinations of temperature and density with three different colors. So take a picture and tag it on Instagram or TikTok, Nautilus Live. We have um, a comment in the chat saying our crew is amazing and how and asking how people can leave home for so long. So how do you guys feel about that? About um, do you guys have people take care of pets, plants, things like that? So what's your process for leaving home? So Mike, how about we start off with you? <laughs> Uh, my home is currently my truck. So. <laughs> um, no, I, we have a dog, and right now my uh, my mom is watching over our dog, and and my dog is harassing her and her dog, so which <laughs> makes me very happy. Simon, how about you? Uh, you have lots of animals, don't you? Uh, no, I have just two cats. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, two cats, a wife, and a son. So yeah. What what about the horses? Yeah, I thought you had farm animals. I don't have horses, no. It's TJ. Oh, TJ, oh, TJ no. has a farm. TJ horses. has horses. Okay. I like, I only, I only like horses with ketchup and fries. <laughs> <laughs> Johan, how about you? How does it feel to leave home? And how, how was your process? Or have anyone? Oh, you're not on SPL. Thank you. Yeah, um, I've been away from home a fair amount over the past few months, so I'm missing it a little bit, missing a little bit of a routine, but it's always great to be out here, uh, and it's a lot of fun, and I'm learning a lot in this new role I'm in, which is also very great. Um, for me, I'm living with my girlfriend back home, and we just have a few plants, which are 
pretty easy for her to manage. <laughs> yeah. The good thing about this job from an hour, from my perspective is you go out and work away for a few weeks, but then when you get home, you're home. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, rather than a regular six day a week, nine to five job where you're at the house every day, I take a small chunk of time, go out and earn some money, and then I can go back and I am home home for a, a good while. So, yeah, that's the main advantage why I don't mind being away. <laughs> Also helps having a partner that does similar work to you as well. Yeah. So mine's gone now for four and a half months. So I I think I'm used to it. Um, actually, so after going to college, um, I started working up in Alaska, and I'd actually go out on fishing boats for three months at a time, or I'd go off on deep sea um, seismic vessels. So this two week stint is actually pretty short for me. And I think when I went, once I got to Hawaii and I started teaching and I was staying in Hawaii with a regular nine to five job, um, I miss it. I miss kind of going out, going to sea and that kind of lifestyle. So I lived that lifestyle of leaving for three months at a time for 10 years. Um, I don't have any, well, I actually have classroom pets. So I technically, I guess I do have pets. I have an axolotl and fish, and then mm. I have plants, and I have plants at home, and I just took my plants and having my students water my plants and feed the fish, and they all have a checklist of changing the water. I have um, some really incredible students that are my TAs, and they've been very well trained on axolotl and fish care and tank maintenance, so... I even got an email from a student with the axolotl video being like, is he okay? And I'm like, he's fine. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So Dan, how about you? How do you, do oh. you, for the Navy, since you're Navy, do you, <laughs> do you leave more often for home and stuff like that? And besides your Nautilus? So I'm time? in the research arm in the Navy. Okay. So, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not in the Navy, uh, you know, like a enlist, uh, enlisted or military. I'm a civilian that works for the Navy. Okay. So I just, I do the research, so I don't have to go out as much anymore. But, uh, um, you know, when I used to go out, had to have my parents take care of the, the stuff that I needed to do. And Zach, how about you? How often do you leave home? Uh, not too often recently, because I've just been a grad student. <laughs> so I've been at home. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any pets yet. Trying to get a dog, want a dog, but I want a dog too. Yeah, hard to get a dog out here if you're just renting. But uh, yeah, my fiance is holding things down at home right now, taking care of anything we do have around the house. But yeah, two weeks is is a good time. It is a good time. It's a good time to 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 get stuff done and yeah, reset a little bit almost in ways. But another question in the chat is: Has anyone ever been in the military? So. Dan is civilian working for the Navy. Anyone else ever been in the military? Oh, Simon, you're not on SPL. Yeah, sorry, I, I served 19 years in the Royal Air Force. And can you tell for the American viewers a little more information about the Royal Air Force? <coughs> so the Royal Air Force was the very first Air Force in the world, formed in September, uh, September 1917 is an amalgamation of the Royal, Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps during the First World War. Um, yeah. Very cool. And, uh, and then we have a comment in the chat saying that they raised a Canadian goose when they were a kid, and they recommend to not raise a Canadian <laughs> goose, and that they are mean birds, and they yeah. will make you late for work because they fly yes. behind the car in the morning. That sounds. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I would not take a goose either. <laughs> no. I, 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 <laughs> oh, we got oh, inked I, again. We just got inked. Yeah. Another in the more ink. I think. I so we just. I, I slightly we misheard that at the beginning. Raced a Canadian goose. I've, I've raced <laughs> a few of them to try and get away from. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wouldn't recommend raising one. <laughs> raising one, maybe. <laughs> I lived um, in Wisconsin for a little bit when I was in high school, and we were on a pond, and this... Oh, there's the squid. Oh, yeah, you can see it. Um, and we would get Canadian geese all the time in this pond, especially because the pond would have a bubble in the middle to aerate it, so in winter it wouldn't ever 
fully ice up. So we'd get a lot of these geese sitting in the pond and it was really funny to watch them run around on the ice. And one time my dog tried to chase one and the goose turned around and bit her on the nose and my dog has never chased a goose again. Yeah, well, huh. I don't have that dog. I'm a lot surprised of, didn't huh. eat your dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of farmers will keep them as, uh, instead of guard dogs, they'll have geese. I think visit. they used to eat Canadian geese. Like I think it was that the Canadian goose population actually um, declined a lot because people were hunting and eating them and then they became protected and now there's just a million of them. Yeah. Yeah. My grandparents always used to have goose at Christmas. Mm. Goose That's is good. Yeah. I've had Peking duck in China. Oh. Yeah, that was delicious. <laughs> they literally had the ducks kind of just sitting there like still alive when you walked into the restaurant. Wow. <laughs> That's fresh. It was fresh. It was good, though. Do you have it on its own or with quackers? <laughs> 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 All right. So giving you an update, we're at 76 meter, and we are now at 26 degrees Celsius. So really getting close to that 50 meter cutoff point. So any last minute dying questions, Hit them in the chat real quick here. Anyone have any final thoughts that they'd like to share? It was a beautiful full moon tonight. Oh, I have not even had the chance yet. Out. Yeah, none of us have, we haven't really had time to go out and appreciate it, but pretty soon here I will. It will still be there. Yeah. <laughs> We get to miss every single sunset. I know. Just to be with you. <laughs> yes. So viewers, I hope you appreciate our sacrifice of sunsets. And you like, uh, have you, has anyone seen the green flash before? I have not. I've been no. waiting for that for years, but I, I'm not. I have. You have? Uh -huh. I saw an amazing, one of my best green flashes were actually here on the big island off the coast of Kona when I was on a boat when we're going out to go swim with the manta rays. We had dolphins, green flash. It was amazing. Wow. Um, where'd you see the green flash? Also nearby here, somewhere between uh, San Diego and Honolulu. Mm. I can't remember. It was right towards the end, though. It was close to Hawaii, I think. Yeah. yeah. So we, uh, since we are missing stop. the sunset, we are missing the green flash. But we are now at 50 meters, so we are going to sign off. Thank you so much for watching this uh, dive with us. We will see you tomorrow morning Goodbye. for our next dive. Have a good night. Bye. I'll stop at five yep. zero meters. Yep. Yeah, you guys ready. are ready? Oh yeah. Yep. Jack, we are ready to come up. Yeah, we're even in now.
control deck. Uh, I have eyes on Atlanta and her looks uh, in a good position. Copy. Simon, I'm turning off your mezzo. Roger, thank you. Uh, yeah, you can leave it on for now. Um, um, your SPL, you can turn that off. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, just leave that on. It'll come off when we when we take power off the high voltage. So, yeah. Where are we at now? Uh, Ten meters. Coming up now. Let's probably kill your lights. Probably kill the lights on. Other. Yeah. Just see them. Control deck, can you get a perp to stay out? Uh, go ahead a little bit. Copy. Simon, can you pull? Yeah, just turn forward now. Sweet, thanks.
Until the thing's up. All stations, that's the recovery line uh, on Herc and uh, starting to even. Okay, copy that. Stack, full stack. Uh, control, can Herc uh, drive ahead there? 100% ahead. Yeah. I'm 100% ahead. 100 ahead of Redman. Okay. Coming to starboard there. Lights are still on. <laughs> as long as she comes back with the lights on and the camera's working. Okay, hey, Herc power, sec Herc power okay. secure. Okay. Um, we're diving very close to here tomorrow. We're going to just DP over to the site. Um, I still just want to pull the moon pool up. Okay. Put it back down. Why not? Should we uh, give the bridge position first or tell them um, to hold? And then I don't have it loaded in yet. Just do the move pool and then we'll go over. It's it's literally like a like a few like a kilometer or so. Okay. Just another little mound. Yeah. Nice. So you can Yeah, I'll wrap up. Told me to the gym. Between the octagon, bro. <laughs> <laughs> 